people will burn a bridge and think it's not going to hurt them, but there's plenty of people who will just recognize that. I think people honestly believe that they're going to get a two family, three family and just become a millionaire and just go chill on the beach. Just have a plan. As long as you're taking steps and moving forward towards that goal, you will get there. Welcome to another episode of the Profitable Path Podcast. I am your host, Marco Cabrera, and today we have a special guest, Dr. Joe Gazzardi. He is a real estate investor that in only three and a half years has acquired 20 buildings and now manages 14 properties with over 60 doors. Learn how he balances this success with his career as a physical therapist and a family man. Joe, how you doing, man? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for coming. Um, but let's get right into it, just like we always do. So what was your life like before real estate investing and physical therapy? Sure. So uh, basically graduated high school, and I should start right before then. I uh, was playing high school football, got hurt, had to go through physical therapy. And, you know, as you go into that senior year, you have to kind of figure out what you're doing, right? Yeah. So uh, at first I thought I was going to do athletic training and, uh, you know, you start looking at salaries and what you're going to do and physical therapist was quite a bit higher than a, an athletic trainer. So went to college, uh, you know, the traditional path of college, you know, get a degree, you know, make some good money. At least I thought what would be good money to me uh, mm -hmm. at the time. And go through the six years of college, get my doctorate degree, and uh, off we went. Nice, nice. And did you land a job like right after college? Yeah, yeah. So basically during that last senior year, it's a little bit of, uh, you know, it's e a little bit easier going. You start going out for interviews and, yeah. and stuff with uh, certain jobs. And, you know, once I graduated, started work a couple months thereafter because I wanted to take, you know, at least a month or two off. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, quite honestly, the hustle kind of started right after that because mm -hmm. I didn't just work the full-time job once I graduated. After like three or four months, I knew that money was a real thing and I wanted more of it. And, you know, I had a lot of student debt to pay for. That was my next question. Yeah. How much debt yeah. did you have when you finished? Because <laughs> how many years did you of school did you go? So it was six years, okay. uh, basically three undergrad and then three grad school. Um, and basically came out to like 180 grand. And that was with my parents paying for some of my room and board. Wow. And yeah, how old are you? crazy. Uh, I graduated at, I was 24. 24 years old, $180,000 debt. Yep. Wow. Crazy. You it's have crazy. no time to take off. You There's no it. time to take off. So, yeah. you know, I, like I said, I started the hustle and I uh -huh. added a part-time job. Okay. So I was working like 50, 55 hours a week. And it was good because I didn't really have any responsibilities other than myself and yeah. my girlfriend at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it, it was it was easy to manage. Wow. So, all right. So you, you graduated uh, physical therapy. Um, then once you got your job, is that where the interest for real estate came from? So I was practicing for a few years. I've been practicing for over 11 years now. And I want to say, let me just think on how many years, but I would say probably about five or six years in, you know, we get married, have our first kid mm -hmm. and for anyone who knows, if you have a kid, your house gets exponentially smaller, <laughs> yeah. you know? So yeah, and I don't know where you have another person you know, living we, with we you. know, we were looking to <laughs> upgrade. We were looking to get a very large two-family. And, you know, it's when the gears start turning. You know, I was like, all right, we could get some additional rent to pay for these homes. I'm out in Staten Island. The houses, you know, this is pre-COVID, were, you know, typically more expensive than out here in Jersey. Yeah. So. You know, we were going down that avenue. We listed our house. Uh, we were looking for houses. And long and the short of it is it just never panned out. Uh, yeah. We either had buyers that were failing or we didn't find anything that uh, that we had liked. And uh, we wound up pulling our house off the market after like six months. Okay, so you got into the two family first. We no, didn't. So we owned a single family home. Got it. And then you tried to put and it on the market and that was just... Exactly. People weren't delivering. Mm -hmm. So the goal was to sell it and then get into a two family. Exactly. Correct. Okay. So yep. so what'd you do next once it wasn't selling? You so I was talking with my loan officer at the time and, uh, you know, you start thinking of and reading, getting into like the bigger pockets and some of the YouTube stuff and anything you start looking at the internet, you start getting these ads and obviously all these other things for, for real <laughs> yeah. estate. Right. Yeah. And my loan officer happened to own a two family down okay. in Asbury park. Oh, nice. And he was telling me about his property manager, this guy, Ray, who I've now become very close with. Mm -hmm. 
And I was like, all right, you know, let's maybe start looking for rentals. And the goal of that, the goal was to do a cash out refinance on our primary because we had built up the equity over the first handful of years, Mm -hmm. typical appreciation. And that's exactly what we did. We did a cash out refinance and we wound up buying a three family property in the Neptune area, which is, it's literally on the border of Asbury Park and Neptune. Yeah, it's a great, great location. I am, and what year was that? Yeah, that was three weeks before COVID in 2020. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Right before. Right before. Now, did it have tenants in there already? It was fully rented. And when I ran the numbers, it was a conventional purchase. Mm-hmm. So, you know, at the time for a three family that was retail, yeah. uh, I was estimated to make about $500 a month cash flow. And I was very okay. excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's better than nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Now, when COVID happened, did they continue to pay? They did not. <laughs> they did not. Like so, most. Yeah. Uh, two of the three tenants actually were good. Uh, one was basically collecting uh, disability. Uh, the other was, you know, a hardworking family. And the one individual who happened to be in the smallest unit, um, thankfully that was the case, um, wound up falling behind. He got laid off. And, you know, he was out of work probably about four months. Wow. And uh, it took about, I would say, about four. 14, 15 months to finally for the state, one of his app, one of the applications went through to, to get uh, his back rent. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, all right, you, you finally find a place, you, you refied out of your single family. Correct. Use the cash to put down on a three family, which is a great, yep. great move. Mm-hmm. Um, but now you run into the issues of tenants not paying. Yep. So when did that pan out? Has it panned out? Did you get new tenants? So in that building... Uh, for the most part, everyone is still there. The one tenant who fell behind is still there, and he's actually been living in that building for over 30 years. Wow. So he's at, been there longer than, like, a few of the owners who have yeah. owned that building. There's only been one tenant that's been replaced uh, since then, and it was because he was moving down to, I think it was, like, Atlanta. All right. All right, so you still you ran into a hiccup, but mm-hmm. it still didn't take away from the vision that you had to get into – Buying and holding. Not at all. Not at all. So what happens next? I y- Once you buy one property, you get bit by the bug. At least yeah. most people do, even if you go through some of these crazy times. Because, you know, 2020 was, was kind of unique. But mm-hmm. I knew what my vision was. I wanted to have at least some multifamily properties. Mm-hmm. And I had to figure out how to do and take that next step. Because I only had so much money left out of the cash out refi. Yeah. And without really recognizing the power of of partnerships and relationships. I wound up partnering with a buddy of mine who I went to school with. Okay. And uh, we purchased another three family down in Atlantic City. Okay. Right at the tail end of 2020. So when you say partnered, um, did you start raising capital? So we essentially just did another conventional purchase and we split the down payment 50-50. Got it. Mm -hmm. But you were able to move faster. Instead of just waiting for... We we were able to to move that. I I would still call it like that retail pace at that point because it was still a uh, a retail purchase it was on market um but you know we were starting to look at the numbers and we saw what you know the price to rent ratio especially at that time down in uh, in atlantic city was uh was really cool all right that's awesome so now um all right so now you have a partner but you're still buying retail so did you stop buying retail after that uh pretty much yeah uh basically what my next step was trying to figure out how do I buy more with, with either without any money or with other people's money or how do I get into some type of real estate like wholesaling to fund my, my purchases. And that's when I met uh, a couple of my initial mentors and they basically taught me how to find properties, how to put deals together and how to raise capital. Wow. Wow. So fast forward, um, through mentorship, through understanding uh, that you don't have to go the traditional methods of purchasing homes. Is that how you were able to streamline three and a half years later? Absolutely. To build a portfolio? Absolutely. Yeah, it was those basic building blocks, which I really kind of fell into. And the first, so the first book that I read in real estate was uh, called Money People Deal with with Stefan Arneo. He's uh, a guy based out of Canada. He's unfortunately no longer with us. Um, But that book was the essential three pieces from my understanding. And my mentors basically preached and taught me the same thing. Um, So there's the money, which is the part of the deal. So you have to find the money to to do the deal. Uh, Ironically enough, that's the least valuable piece of the puzzle. Um, Then there's the deal, which is the most 
valuable piece of the puzzle. And then there's the people who either need to put and structure things together or manage the, uh, the asset. Yeah, it's good. You mentioned that money, the most invaluable piece mm-hmm. of the puzzle. And I think that's the roadblock that a lot of people hit, or they just don't understand about real estate. Like if you have the deal, you'll find the money. It's definitely a mindset thing. And you know, it's funny you bring that up. A lot of times that can be the case, but uh, there have been times where I found a deal and <laughs> I haven't found the money. And that that's a whole other conversation yeah. uh, that's certainly built around relationships and having you know, people willing to, to trust and invest with you. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's it. Oftentimes if you have a good deal, you will, you should, if you're open-minded enough, be able to find a way to fund it. Yeah. So let's talk about that. You had a deal, but not the money. So Mm -hmm. why don't you give us, uh, like a tough moment, maybe that one in real estate and how you overcame that situation. Sure. There, it was a few obstacles. There's one particular deal that's come to mind. I, uh, you know, I was always educated to try and think big, right? You want to take that next step and take leaps. And if it's not big enough, if, it, if you're not scared about what you're doing, then it's not big enough, right? Yeah. So I wound up putting out a LOI on a 50 bed rooming house, what I thought was a rooming house down in Newark. And I certainly did not have the down payment and the down payment was over half a million dollars. 50 bed rooming house. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So basically... Why don't don't you explain to our listeners what a rooming house is? Sure, sure, sure. So a rooming house, at least here in the state of New Jersey, uh, there are licensed rooming houses and then licensed boarding homes and and group homes. And they're kind of categorized and regulated by the Division of Community Affairs, so the state of New Jersey. And basically a rooming house is kind of on the the lowest totem pole, so to speak. And not that it's bad, it's just you're, you're giving the lowest level of care or things provided. So... You're purely providing rooming, and that's basically it. Okay. Um, so it can be a very large, like, Victorian home with rooms that are rented out, or it could be like a apartment-style uh, type of building where it's rooms and hallways and bathrooms, and that's pretty much it. So it has to meet a minimum requirement. There's definitely requirements if you're licensed that you need to abide by, and you get inspected annually. Now, is this government-funded? It's not, it's kind of indirect. So a lot of our residents, they may be receiving social security, um, disability funds, uh, could be veterans, uh, funds as well. Um, my rooming house is down in Camden. Now they're actually receiving a TRA or temporary rental assistance that is funded purely through the County of Camden. Okay. So indirectly, yes. Uh, in some instances they, they're paying directly. Um, but other instances people are paying us cash. Wow. Nice. All right. So you have this huge project, 50 mm-hmm. rooms. Yes. What happens? Next? So I had, to find, I had to find a way to come up with uh, over half a million dollars. Huh. And, you know, you start, it's funny, when, when you get put in that moment, you start taking massive action and you just start telling everyone what you got on the plate and yeah. how good of an opportunity it is for yeah. others. And, you know, I happened to be at a seminar mm-hmm. and someone who was actually speaking at the event had, you know, I forget what the name of the presentation was, but it was something about scaling and he wanted to help people scale and du- I think it was like double your double your doors or something like that. And it kind of spoke to me because that was really what a goal I was trying to do there. I yeah. had like around 50 doors at the time and I was like, holy crap, I could get to 100 right from this one deal. That'd be yeah. great. And basically, you know, it was a very well-known person, but uh, long story short, we came to an agreement verbally that he was going to take 60% of the deal and I would take 40 and he would basically fund the entire thing. Wow. Until I had to do the earnest money and he disappeared. Really? <laughs> uh, so now I'm back to the drawing board. Uh-huh. I call the wholesaler who brought me the deal. He has some contacts who happen to also own rooming houses. Okay. And we start talking and trying to put hypothetical deal structures together. And while I'm talking with them, I'm letting the lender who's going to be funding the debt on the deal know what the situation is. And he introduces me to multiple contacts, which is priceless. So now I'm building trust with a lot of different people. And uh, ultimately we landed on uh, an agreement with someone who was already in one of the communities I'm with uh, in New Jersey, uh, an online community. And they also happen to own rooming houses. And we ultimately agreed that, you know, I would take like 25% and the other three guys would take 25% and help me fund the rest of the deal. Wow. That's awesome. So you got it done. 
uh, I got the funding done. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> then the next uh, yeah, <laughs> the, the, the hurdle was basically that uh, this was a building that once again, indirectly funded uh, from a government entity. Okay. Uh, it was essentially a veteran's home. Wow. Uh, that was, and it wasn't a licensed rooming house, which we thought it was. It was actually a shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, so during our due diligence, we had found out that the owner had lost a contract with the VA. And that ultimately killed the deal because the contract with the VA was actually the most valuable piece yeah. because he was getting residents in and out and it was a triple net lease. So the business was the business that was staying there. We were just coming in and owning the building, not av actively having to manage the asset aside from like the brick and mortar stuff. Yeah. So wow. we actually wound up backing out because the deal, you know, if that guy loses the VA contract, that building, instead of being worth 2 million, it's probably worth like a third of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that pretty much made it too risky. <laughs> yes. And absolutely. everybody wanted to pull out after that. Exactly. So, I mean, what did you learn from that? I mean, it was a lot, right? You it had to raise the capital, then you finally raise the capital, then this happens. Um, I'm sure there's tons of golden lessons in there. The first is don't give up. Don't just stop. Don't stop it. No, just, just, just keep going. Yeah. Um, the second most certainly is always have backup capital yeah. uh, for your deals. Even if, you know, especially if it's larger, just, just keep looking. You just never know what's going to happen. Even if it's someone that pulls out half their money, at least you know that you, you have some others that may be able to back, to back you up on it. Uh, and that doesn't, that's not limited to other people either. That's, including myself or yourself as, as a, as another investor, like I've gone out of my way now to really like focus on getting business lines of credit mm -hmm. and really building up that line for an event like this, where Holy crap, someone pulls out last minute. I need to come up with 50 grand. Yeah. I can do it. You know, I couldn't say that six to 12 months ago. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so now you're leveraging uh, credit lines to get deals done. Now you said you already had 50 doors before you got into this rooming project. Yep. So how did you get so many doors in such a small amount of time? So I want to say it was 2021. That was the year that I picked up the most doors. And that was from a combination of just kind of going back to those roots and really taking what I've learned mm -hmm. and just putting it in action. I was telling everyone what I was doing I was showing the people, although it was a short track, track record at the time, I was showing the people what I was doing and I was just explaining to them, hey, like myself and my partners, we're putting these types of deals together and you're getting very strong returns on them mm -hmm. and you have an opportunity to invest alongside with us. So I was part, most, for the most part, I was raising uh, the funds or the gap, pay, the gap funds for the deal. So the down payment essentially. And then I was partnering with others. Over the last couple, it was also um, myself actually finding the deal from other wholesalers. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome, man. That's good stuff. Now, how do you keep up with all the industry changes, right? Because you got into this first deal, it's 2020, and then from 20 to 2021, things changed a lot, right? Yep. Rates were down, then rates go up. Like, how do you manage to adjust and to stay consistent with building out your portfolio? Sure. So, you know, I'm constantly talking with people who are who are in the industry constantly looking online and, and, you know, Google's pretty good. They just like start sending your articles now right to like your feed. So that's always helpful. But, you know, even just this morning, I was talking with one of my lenders and say, hey, like where are the rates at on this type of loan product, uh, specifically for the ones at uh, with my rooming houses? Because those, you know, th these are very unique assets. Not everyone funds them. And I feel like today, because of the type of bank and the funding that I'm using, I'm actually at an advantage. Mm -hmm. Uh compared to others where they may only be looking at seller financing or having to come in with cash or maybe not even have any of the above. So I, I kind of need to tweak my underwriting to see what those rates are. And I was actually pleasantly surprised when I found out what that number was this morning. Yeah. Um, and it just makes the deals I'm looking at that much stronger. It can improve my offers. Mm -hmm. um, but talking to people in your network, like lenders, people in insurance, uh, yeah. insurance rates are going up like crazy, especially like crazy. in New Jersey. Yeah. So just kind of staying on top of those, uh, yeah. those types of people in your network. That, that's really what's important. So how do you keep your ear on the street? Like, do you have a team or constantly going to meetups, groups, and the, the, like the online teams that you have? So in, in terms of just like what's going on in the world of real estate, definitely in-person meetups and phone calls, uh, just talking with people in general, ideally in person uh, is, is definitely the best. Uh, in terms of managing the, the street part of it with uh, the actual properties, 
each property is kind of a little bit different. Some of, some of the properties I have is actively managed within the partnership. Okay. So all of us either have real estate licenses or someone who's active, whether it's a contractor and so forth. Um, otherwise, it's, uh, it's me hiring out third party. Okay. Or uh, I'm doing it myself. Got it. Mm-hmm. How many do you do yourself? Because you're still uh, working as a physical therapist. I am. Like, how yeah. do you juggle, <laughs> you know, managing properties and still, you know, staying in your career? It's it's not easy. I'll tell you that. Um, it definitely requires a lot of grit and a lot of hard work and a lot of late evenings. Um, but a lot of it is putting some systems in place specifically for the buy and hold side. So, you know, getting my rents kind of paid in somewhat of an automatic manner. Um, having some go-to people, certainly having boots on the ground in these areas is yeah. really, really helpful. Um, the neat thing is about the licensed rooming houses, you actually have to have an on-site operator who lives at the property. Oh, wow. So he's my eyes and ears on the ground. Uh, I don't trust everything that they say or, or that they're willing to do, but you know, it's one of those things you, you kind of, you listen, you verify, and then you kind of just make your own decision. Yeah. But they are definitely my eyes and ears on the ground. So it's like having an on-site super. Exactly. It's exactly right. right. So you you really don't have one company that you use for property management. Every deal is different. Every deal is different. What I've started to do now, though, especially with my larger deals, is I've created a property management company uh, basically to allow me to take credit and get paid for the active management of it, which I felt was like a very good income stream for me. And while it's not a ton of money today, uh, I foresee it being pretty helpful uh, over the next few years to help me kind of leave the W2 potentially, uh, or just supplement it even more than it already is. Yeah. Yeah. It just Mm -hmm. adds value to your umbrella of companies. Exactly. Right. And um, it's like a no brainer. It's like, you're doing it anyways. Why not? That's exactly right. And my thought was, if I'm actively managing these buildings, whether I'm just managing the books, staying on top of other property managers, or actually physically doing all of all of it, I should be paying myself. Yeah, <laughs> And absolutely. especially on the, uh, the larger assets. Like I'm looking at licensed rooming houses now. They're 20 beds, they're 30 beds, they're 50 beds. So, you know, I, I have to get paid for my time now. And I'm taking that very seriously. Yeah, as you should. You know, we, I just recently got into lawn care, believe it or not. And it was like, because I was subbing out so much stuff when we hold our properties. And I'm like, lawn care, if, if I could use the system that I use in wholesaling, like I wanted sure. to prove it to myself and add it to lawn care. And if I could scale that, right. then it's just, it proves that it's all about the system. Absolutely. Right. And I did that and it worked. Um, you know, we, we had a profitable first year, first season. Awesome. So now I'm like, yeah, you could pretty much implement that in anything. You have a system, it works, you're doing it anyways. Why not start a company, a branch off, like a sister company that can mm-hmm. maintain your own properties? And it's all within like the same umbrella. Like it's still tied to real estate, which yeah. is important. Like if, you know, you were to say something else completely out of left field, maybe it's a little bit more challenging. Yeah, like some right? hot but, dogs. But, <laughs> right, right. No, no. It's so, but like this is, umbrella. it's all there. And, yeah. you know, for me, am I looking to take on other people's properties? Absolutely not. Not right mm-hmm. now. I've definitely made that decision. But for the, uh, the properties that I have some ownership equity or stake in, uh, it's just, it's, it's the move that makes the most sense. What type of system do you have in play to stay consistent with picking up properties and managing everything? So in terms of acquisitions, um, I don't really have a good system and that's probably where I'm lacking at the moment. Uh, however, the one thing that has proven very, very strong to me has been the relationships with others. So I would say the deals that come to me now, especially the rooming house deals, it's all relationships. It's, hey, you are one of two people who is crazy enough to buy one of these things and I'm coming to you and they, and they know what I'm buying. Like a lot of it's now for me, very relationship driven. So a lot of agents, a lot of other wholesalers, even people in the insurance and lending world are coming to me with deals because they know exactly what my buy box is and they know I perform. So I guess we can call that a system, yeah. uh, the relationship system. But that's been the one thing that's been very, very uh, successful for me. No, yeah, I tell my team all the time. Uh, the moment they realize that it's about relationships, especially in acquisitions, 
it's not about real estate. It's mm -hmm. about the, the relationship. It's about the trust you're building with the seller. Right. Once you realize that, you're going to get more deals under contract. Yes. And even on the dispo side, you know, talking to buyers that you trust that you know are going to deliver and vice versa. They trust the wholesaler because you're going to give them the first deal because they deliver. Right. right. So there's so much that's built on trust, integrity, and just good relationships. And it, it goes so far, and it's, it's, pro it's probably something that's just, like, understated, you know, because, you know, people will burn a bridge and think it's not going to hurt them, but there's plenty of people who will just recognize that. Real estate's yeah. a very small world, and especially if you're very. sticking in New Jersey, mm -hmm. everyone knows who everyone is, yep. you know? So <laughs> yeah. you have to do good by everyone, and, I, and I'm a firm believer of that. Yeah, and that's the problem with a lot of wholesalers, and I try to educate on uh, how to get deals under contract, you know, not only with people in the industry, but, you know, motivated sellers who are in a tough situation and they're promising the world. Like it just gives a bad name for wholesalers all around. It's real estate in general, and it's it's not exclusive to one particular group. I mean, there's, I'm sure, you know, there, there's bad apples in, in every yeah, group, agents, right? And it's, lenders, it's, <laughs> it's all the above, and, yeah. it's, and it's not just real estate. I mean, I see it in healthcare too. There's, yeah. there's people who are extremely financially driven, uh, for the wrong reasons uh, in healthcare. I mean, there's surgeons, there's, I mean, you want to go really macro hospital organizations and, and all oh, that, yeah. like there's you know, the government. I mean, we, we could be here for a while, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there, there's a lot, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, once again, just, you know, bringing that home, like if you do the right thing by people and you continue to prove that you close on deals and you're bringing value to someone, then you're going to have no problem at all in this world. Yeah. So, I mean, you love what you do as a physical therapist, helping people. What do you love more? Is it real estate <laughs> or physical therapy? So I used to get this question a lot when I first started and uh, I haven't gotten it recently up until now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the way I look at it is I'm helping people one way or the other. And that's, I feel like that's kind of just in my blood or my thing, or that's what's kind of the God given talent, right? That's good. Um, helping people, whether it's in physical therapy, whether it's in real estate, whether it's helping others achieve financial freedom by partnering up with me or just giving them opportunities through real estate. That's where I feel like I'm very strong and I don't mind. And I, I shouldn't say I don't mind. I, I really do like and enjoy educating people as well. Um, so that I feel like, whether it's the PT or the real estate, it, it kind of meshes. Um, I mean, look, I've been doing physical therapy now for 11 years. I, I think just the general treating part is, is probably getting a little bit stale for me. I, I enjoy managing up from like a higher level and, and leading people. So really probably what, what the best fit for me is, is leading others within like an organization of PT or, or healthcare or whatever it is. That's probably where my strong suit is. That's point. awesome, man. So you have a clear understanding of what your why is, which is helping people. And it seems like you're, you grew in the business, mm -hmm. you know, in physical therapy and in real estate yep. to the point where you feel convicted to educate people on it. Right. So yeah. that's awesome. Now, what would be your superpower? Hmm. Can we go back to helping people? I think I, I feel like that that might be what it is. Yeah, it might be you know, um, both in one. And I, you know what? I, I haven't really, I didn't really recognize that up until like really actually getting into the thick of the real estate thing. Like, yeah. I don't think I thought, I don't believe I thought that way. Yeah. Um, just doing the physical therapy part of it. Like, if, don't get me wrong. It feels good when you get someone who's had an injury or whatever it is uh, from a medical perspective. And, you know, they go from not being able to walk to sprinting out on a football field or getting the elderly person who, you know, is in a wheelchair and have, hasn't walked in two years. I'll, that's a crazy story. I'll never forget. The person came into the skilled nursing facility. Caregiver said they haven't walked in two years. They're with us for like six weeks. And this guy's walking up and down in wow. the hallway. And I could have sworn it was like a miracle, That's but a miracle you know, I, I was part of it, you know, yeah. and it was pretty cool. And obviously it wasn't just me. There was a team there. Mm. Um, but those are like the really cool moments in the healthcare side that you kind of live for. And, yeah. you know, it obviously makes you feel good for sure. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And you never realize what you're going to be into in like another five years, right? Mm -hmm. Like your vision with physical therapy started in high school after an injury. Yep. Something bad happened. You pivoted. Fast forward. Um, you realize the industry and now you want to get into real estate, and now you're in real estate doing both, and you're just growing into this whole completely different person. And that's the same, you know, story with me when I got into 
Um, first, I started developing my personal, you know, right. th- through church and being part of a men's group, right? Once I started cleaning that mess up, it opened a door to real estate. Sure. And then after real estate into educating, to a podcast, to social media, like you never know where life is going to take you. And you just got to keep doing the right thing, trusting God and growing and having a clear understanding what your why is. Yep. And it's all like, I see it as like levels of growth, right? So like what you just explained are like what I would consider like huge, massive leaps and levels of growth. And particularly like early on, I feel like some of those leaps are bigger than what you may make them seem potentially like yeah. th- those are big leaps. I feel like that, that you're, you know, you kind of skipped over really quick, but I feel like those are probably big leaps for you. Yeah. Um, and those, you know, that's what really accelerates the growth and you know, what we're doing today, like, it, and what you're doing today is, is, is like truly awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. So why don't we go over some myths? Sure. That <laughs> you want to talk about in real estate? Yeah. So a, a lot of, a lot of people that I hear. So a lot of people now, you know, I've been, thankful enough that people now come up to me and ask for help or their advice on things. And a lot of people have this thing because they look on YouTube and bigger pockets and all these things. And it's not that these are bad places, but they have this idea, at least specific in New Jersey, that you can cash flow day one buying like a retail rental with 96 and a half percent leverage. And that's a myth. (laughs) Maybe that used to be the case. Um, some years back, but you're just not going to be able to find that these days. And if you do, it's a unicorn. Um, so I would say finding a heavy, heavy cash flowing asset. Um, that's just like a straightforward long-term rental in year one. Uh, that's, that's a myth. You know, you'd have to really, really find a grand slam of a deal for that to be the case. There's probably going to be some heavy stabilization and a lot of work to get to that point. If Mm. you achieve it in, in a year, um, that's what I would say is probably the myth. Yeah, I get that a lot. You know, I think people honestly believe that they're going to get a two family, three family and just become a millionaire and just go chill on the beach. And that's just not they, the reality. They will if they hold on to it and they don't sell. But well, it's going to take I, 20 years. Yeah, but you know what I realized, too? Even people with large portfolios, they're constantly diversifying their assets. Yep. Right. Like a property that I'm like, why are they selling it? But they're just constantly moving around, bringing in income. But reinvesting it they're not going to spend it in Correct. vegas yeah <laughs> you know yeah I mean? yeah they're and doing it for a reason there's a plan absolutely when they do so absolutely absolutely for sure um let's see i'm trying to think of another myth um you know the i, I don't know if it's a myth but the transition of going from full-time w2 to real estate investor is not really something that happens overnight it doesn't. Uh, it's 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 a very hard uh, thing to do, and it requires just a lot of work, a lot of dedication. Yeah. Um, and look, honestly, it's going to be who you're surrounded with at at home too. Like, yeah. You know, if my wife wasn't sticking with me with all this, I there's no way I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with today in, in the real estate world. Like, she's yeah. been an avid supporter, putting up with all of the nonsense that real estate <laughs> brings to the table. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, you know, that's a transition that, especially if you have a family can't really happen overnight. No. Um, I don't want to say can't, but it's, it's very, very challenging to happen very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I, I think that's, you know, for, for anyone listening, like just have a plan in, yeah. in, in place. And just as long as you're taking steps and moving forward towards that goal, you will get there. It just takes some yeah. time. Yeah, I, I actually was was able to transition in six months. That's so I, impressive. Yeah, I got my first deal, and then the pipeline just started filling up. And this was in 2017. And, um, yeah, in six months, I was already making more in real estate investing, in wholesale, than I was at my W-2. Yep. And, uh, you know, I talked to my wife about it. Same thing. She's been supporting me, all my crazy ideas. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's uh, it's been a blessing when you have your partner that's got your back. Hundred you know? percent, absolutely. Yeah, but I think about it because I realized after I left my W two and I wanted to start buying some some rental properties, banks weren't lending to me. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if I look back, I probably would have stayed at my W two a little longer, Got maybe it. like a year and a half, maybe even two years, and just leverage the fact that the banks would give me some capital and continue sure. to to wholesale. That that's just that's me. that's true though. That yeah. that's you know something that I, I honestly wasn't even thinking about, but. You do have to be bankable, you know, according to the bank, not according yeah. to like what's actually in your bank account. Yeah. But it's you have to be bankable and 
these lenders, you know, they want to see your, your, your tax returns or bank statements, or they want to see quite a bit of stuff, especially today. Yeah. Uh, things have tightened up obviously. So, yeah. And you mentioned, uh, building like lines of credit. Why don't you explain to our listeners how you're doing that? So I've been very fortunate. So I basically paid for, for some mentorship on, on that. And this person, I continue to talk with him, uh, maybe on like a one to two times a month basis. And he educated me from the personal credit perspective with the goal of, hey, we're going to transition to, to business credit. Um, and he goes over, you know, which cards to, to try and go after. And let's say if there's certain expenses that you normally use, uh, you know, use this type of card or like open up a Quill account, like yeah, there you go. different things to, <laughs> you know, to that you, that you normally use that yeah. you can kind of use on the business. Yep. Right. And then that begins to kind of build the, the credit. And, uh, you know, obviously th these folks help you with applications and, and things and have relationships, you know, with, with other banks that are maybe more favorable for, for lending yeah. uh, on, on the lines of credit. But, I had terrible business credit and not because I did anything wrong. It's just, I literally had no trade, li trade lines. Yeah. Um, so just from the education of him telling me, Hey, you should open up accounts with these types of businesses and continue to purchase from them. You know, every other month it's like, Oh, new trade line popped up. Yeah. And uh, you know, my, I don't know those scores off the top of my head, but they've yeah. definitely risen over the last like six months. And That's good. It, it's no thanks, but to, uh, to my guy, Anthony over there. Yeah. yeah. There you go. A little, Special plug to, to, <laughs> to Anthony. But, um, but yeah, I did the same thing. I, I invested into uh, mentorship to teach me a bit about business credit because until then I was putting everything on my personal name. And uh, that's a big no-no, yep. right? And um, same thing. I mean, this is a nice little hack for all you listeners. Create a, an account with Dun & Bradstreet, mm -hmm. right? And then you open a Quill account, order something on consignment. could be super little, um, pack of pens, and you do that for a few months. It starts reporting your credit to Dun & Bradstreet. And now you're starting to build business credit. Then you could apply for an Amex or something that gives you, uh, you know, a credit card that you could leverage. Yeah. And there's definitely like, if you do enough research and talk to enough people, there are certain banks who will give you like pretty good limits right off the bat, even if yeah. there isn't like a ton of seasoning on, on your LLC. Um, so yeah, that, that, that information's helpful. Yeah, good stuff, man. If you're looking to dive into the world of real estate, we have the perfect tools and resources just for you. Our carefully selected top secret document library is packed with proven documents to streamline your transactions and help you navigate the real estate market with confidence. Additionally, we offer a comprehensive wholesale 101 masterclass designed specifically for beginners. In this course, you'll learn everything you need to know about finding affordable properties, negotiating lucrative deals, and building a network of eager buyers. We're here to empower you with the knowledge and skills necessary to flourish in the real estate industry. But that's not all. The Real Estate Investor Secret Vault is your gateway to unlimited success. Our marketing matrix and calculators will assist you in making informed decisions, ensuring maximum profits effortlessly. So don't miss out on this incredible opportunity to kickstart your real estate journey. Join us today and unlock the secrets that will propel your real estate career to new heights. Log on to investorsvault.club and get started now. Now let's get back to our program. So what do you uh, foresee in the future uh, as far as real estate happening? Interest rates and everything going on? <sighs> so, I mean, the, the everyone said... The, Everyone's saying the interest rates are starting to come down, and they are. Um, but that always makes me nervous because everyone is saying it, and that that to me just I don't know. I don't like when everyone is saying the same thing. Yeah, that's that's kind of problematic for me. I try to like <laughs> to go against the grain a little bit, uh -huh. um, but I do think rates will stabilize and come down a little bit. I don't think they're going to come down a ton. Uh, I don't know if I necessarily agree that they're coming down, um, but you know it seems like that's the case right now. So for me. I'm still in buying mode. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm still in buying mode and I'm still attacking the rooming house asset class heavily because I feel like I have a advantage when it comes to the lending. And now I actually have people who want to invest with me specifically for rooming houses. Um, so it's, it's something that I'm really looking to go like 110% in right now. Yeah. Same thing. When the, when the rates were high, we were buying, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. and when the rates go down, we're going to buy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> or you know, Really, you know, if you think about it, 
when the rates are high, that's the best time to, to purchase because if you are able to acquire an asset that even if it's breaking, breaking even, when those rates come back down and you have the ability to refinance, you're in a much, much stronger position. Mm -hmm. And even if you are breaking even and the interest rates don't go down, rents will always go up, yeah. especially here in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So you really can't lose the only time you do lose is if you absolutely need to sell. Um, so if you're in a situation where you need to sell and you buy at the wrong time, that's where it gets problematic. Yeah. Um, but I look, if you're buying a cash flowing asset and the interest rates are where they were at their peak, eight, nine percent, depending on the lender you were going with, and that's cash flowing, you're going to be very happy in about a year or so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Two things that I always say that I regret. Number one, not buying more right? Properties. And number two, not attending enough free networking events to gain knowledge like this. It's priceless, really. The, the, the networking events, I forget, I was listening, I don't know if it was a podcast or an audio book, but there was some, I think the word was like a $15,000 or $10,000 contact. Mm -hmm. And the goal that I went into on that evening when I, I was listening to it on the way to a networking event was, all right, I just got to find that $10,000 contact. I did not meet a $10,000 contact that night. I met probably a, a six-figure contact wow. that evening. Wow. Now, we haven't done a deal yet, but our relationship has grown tremendously. Yeah. And I know that he knows that we trust each other. Yeah. And it's just a matter of him wrapping his head around the rooming house business and that type of investing. Uh, this particular individual was basically an LP, and that's, you know, he, he works a very, uh, very good W-2, but... He uh, actively, you know, pursues syndications as, as, a, as a limited partner. Mm -hmm. And that's like all of his metrics as an engineer. It's very specific, very fine-tuned formulas, like very detail-oriented. Mm -hmm. So he has all his syndications. Like he knows what's a good deal to him or not. Yeah. And, you know, he's in that box and I understand it. So he's trying to get comfortable with being outside of that box in order mm -hmm. to do something like what I'm doing. Got it. That's awesome, man. So why don't you share some advice that you would give someone who wants to get started in real estate investing? Sure. So th the first thing I would say is you want to think about what your why is. And we spoke about it earlier. Yeah. You want to have a good, strong why mm -hmm. you're going to be investing in real estate. Like what is, what is the reason for it? Is it mm -hmm. because you want to leave your W-2? Is it because you want to build financial wealth? Is it because you want to build a retirement plan? Like what is what is the why behind it? I mean, for me, it's all of those. <laughs> um, but but you you really want to know what the purpose is of getting into it. Otherwise, you're never going to take action. And that's really the second step. To be quite honest, a lot of people talk about real estate investing. They go to real estate meetup events. They listen to audiobooks. They go to conferences, and then they do nothing. Mm -hmm. And that's like it kills me inside. It really does because these people are spending so much time doing all this research, and then. They don't take action because they're trying to learn everything. Yeah. And uh, it's impossible to do so. Uh, so I guess I kind of went down, you know, um, going to number three would, would essentially be you're not going to know everything going into every deal. Yeah. Um, so just you, ha you have to just be OK with not knowing 100 percent of, of everything. And I'll give you I'll give you an example. Uh, that first property that I bought over in Neptune. Mm -hmm. I bought in the winter. I happen to have a thing with buying properties in the winter that I don't know what it is, but I buy the most in the winter for whatever reason. Okay. Um, so anyway, we go see the property. Obviously we see it, you know, it has a nice big driveway on the side and it comes like April. I want to say it was like April or May and the tenants calling me like screaming. And he's like, you got to cut the grass. And I'm like, what grass? I'm like, there was no grass here. <laughs> he's like the whole side in the front lawn like it's all grass and I didn't see any grass because it was winter time it was all dirt to me it was dirt rocks tree like everything was like kind of covered it was maybe a little bit of snow even I don't know but I did not recall any grass being there so I didn't learn or know everything at the time right so now I got an $80 a month uh, landscaping bill during during the season yeah you know um so you're just not going to know everything and you have to be comfortable being in that position when you're buying property yeah I tell Barry all the time uh be comfortable being uncomfortable Right? Absolutely. Getting in those places, uh, getting out of character, talking to people, not being shy, following up. That's key. Seems like you do that very well, especially when you meet somebody at a networking event. So um, what's what's next for you, man? What, what do you do? What's your vision for you, your company, your family? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say 
once again, just targeting about five rooming houses this year, that that's goal number one. Uh, goal number two is to really hone in on what I call the short term money. So whether it's wholesaling or agent work or a hybrid of both, um, I'm looking to really start dedicating myself um, to that. Uh, and that's ultimately going to just bring another level of income for me, another stream of income for me. And I think that's going to really just elevate my game and just bring another piece of the puzzle and hopefully help, obviously help others as well, whether it's buying or selling real estate, uh, helping people invest in real estate yeah. and, and, uh, and so forth. That's awesome, man. And I wish you the best. Hopefully, we'll get to do some uh, deals together in the of near course. future. Of course. I appreciate it. I know it. we're talking about a few already. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. I, there will be one. There will yeah, be one. I, absolutely, I, I man. I can get that. So sure. why don't you tell our listeners where they can find you? Sure. So you can find me all over social media, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, at Dr. Joe Does Real Estate. And uh, that's that's my handle. All right. Awesome, man. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Sharing all this knowledge. And uh, we're probably going to get you back on so we could talk a little more about these rooming houses, man. Yeah, It's absolutely. super interesting. But yeah, we're going to leave his uh, his contact in the show notes. Until next time. See ya.